Hello, everybody. My name is Sami. Um, very happy to be here. Um, let's see. Okay, so I am a based in Vancouver at the School of Communication at Simon Fraser University. And as you can see the title of my presentation, I'll be talking about what is called AI textbook. It's very questionable what <laughs> the heck is this AI textbook, right? So um, before I get started, let me just give you a little bit of a context of where I'm coming from. So I was in the financial journalism industry for a while. And while I was interviewing a lot of tech CEOs, that's how I got into sort of the tech and power relationships. And um, my passion has always lied in education. And when I went to the UK um, for my master's, that's when I started delving into more of policy social science work. And now that I am in uh, Vancouver, um, I'm, I'm more interested in understanding sort of the transnational um, currents of how tech and power are panning out. Um, especially in the context of education and also our relationship to tech. So um, some of the other works that I do um, regards to questions of justice, inequality, uh, visions and imaginaries of tech. So one of the works, recent works that I did was around key punch operation, uh, which is which can be understood as a form of uh, female immigration labor. Um, and then uh, obviously gig work, datafication, and exploitation of platform technologies. But today, I'll be talking about AI textbook. So this project began about four years ago, like right at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we all went through, it was not fun. 1.6 billion um, learners were sent home. And that was a time when media was all frenzied to say that we need a major overhaul of the education system. So since then, what's been happening around the world? Well, in September 2020, in Europe, European commissions um, announced DEAP, Digital Education Action Plan, a flagship multi-year policy initiative to reform education system by using EdTech, so um, to provide inclusive, uh, more accessible um, education through the use of technology. And over in South Korea, uh, there was also a very similar education reform initiative that was led by the state government, very centrally orchestrated, sort of top down, almost like a modernization project. Um, and it was touted as the world's first AI textbook um, project. And um, especially in the context of South Korea, education has always been a critical political steering force for state development. Um, as well as the country's post-colonial modernization identity. So when we try to get a bigger picture of how the world is, um, uh, where the world is, so Netherlands, um, Belgium, France, uh, New Delhi, they're all uh, into banning you know, uh, mobile devices uh, used in school settings in the US, UK, sort of the same movement right now. Um, and then in, uh, in Toronto, uh, in Ontario, Cursive is making a comeback, um, uh, trying to go back to sort of the basics. That kind of movement is also being witnessed. Um, in Sweden, about 11 months ago, they're also pulling back all the digital devices from educational setting. But on the other hand, there's also a wider pattern that we see, the growing uh, movement of um, governments trying to use tech as a solution to educational problems. So if you go over to Poland, um, Singapore, they're introducing more laptops, digital devices, and uh, moving into sort of this, this tech solutionist way of thinking. So um, why study this AI textbook case for me is, uh, so this is, this is really um, important because, especially in the context of South Korea, it sort of emblematizes how major crises like COVID-19 really accelerates um, uh, sort of this momentum for uh, providing solutions to these dilemmas that we always go through. The government argues that a datafication of education 
uh, would not only enable the country to remain globally competitive um, and not being um, not not falling into this um, fear of not being able to catch you up um, uh, against other countries, but also to resolve these chronic issues around poor student teacher ratios, urban rural digital divides, and a lot more. So um, right now it's really interesting because it, so this AI textbook initiative was first announced in um, uh, early 2020, right at the COVID-19 pandemic. Now four years have passed. The government is trying to introduce this um, big initiative and, 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 and rolling out the, these AI textbooks by next year, um, March of 2025. And what is interesting is that we're uh, seeing this major backlash from parents. Um, uh, about 50,000 parents signed a petition to the state government saying that we really need to you know, stop this movement for a minute because it's being really rushed. Um, and they're also critiquing how they are using so much money, about $70 million are, are being put into this AI-powered public education. So to give you a little bit of a um, uh, better idea of what this vision of AI textbook um, environment would look like, this is a promotional policy video that I analyzed in my recent paper, um, which is basically an extension of my research currently around AI textbook. So I'm going to play this. So this was a promotional policy video done by the Ministry of Education um, right during the pandemic after they announced this AI textbook initiative. So you sort of get the idea of where you know, the, the government is going with. So, <clears throat> um, so I, I analyzed a series of policy uh, documents from 2020 to 2023 um, along with these promotional videos and um, um, I, I, I basically argue that um, a lot of these pandemic shifts that we see in the educational policies uh, frame education as an optimization of human capital enhancement for the state modernization, um, and that it further subjugates an already politically vulnerable education sector to technocentric solutions, and finally it consolidates a theory of education driven by techno-utopianism which generates an important gap between what is actually feasible and what is just a, you know, imaginary. So you can check um, out this paper at IJOC later if you are interested. So building upon this um, analysis, what I'm trying to grapple with here is why do we then keep falling for this sort of tech solutionist way of thinking? I mean, history tells us that you know, relying on tech doesn't always solve all the existing problems, but we keep seeing this pattern. And also, um, as I uh, mentioned, the AI, this, what is this AI textbook then, right? It basically uh, is still very, uh, um, it, needs to be, it needs to be veiled. Um, so the prototype is still being made at the moment, but it'll be something like an iPad looking device with some AI enabled functions um, that are uh, ostensibly said to personalize the learning experiences, personalize, customize the curriculum of the students, and uh, ostensibly, you know, improve better edu uh, to provide better education. So, in the critical ed tech or data research, um, there are great um, scholars who are really uh, putting together what 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 really we need to what we really need to look at in order to see the bigger picture of um, how these uh, imaginaries or sort of, sort of the myths that we see around tech and modernization um, uh, yeah, need to be addressed. And so it is still a very initial stage of my research, as you can see. So I will really uh, appreciate your feedback or comments as to like where I should kind of like go with. But at this moment, what I'm trying to grapple with is so what are sort of the visions of these AI textbooks being sold to the public? Um, how are they being sold and how does the public internalize these visions? Um, so I'm gonna look at the state's role in this development with other um, stakeholders 
and especially when it comes to um, tech being able to improve a student's critical thinking or critical um, uh, uh, yeah, crit criticality. Um, what's the difference between tool and the textbook? Whereas tool can really, um, the students can use the tools in order to create something new. Whereas textbook, it identifies answers, it provides answers to, um, to certain questions. So I, I think I only have one minute now. Um, so basically, what for, for in order to answer this particular question, what I'm going uh, with methodologically is to do some content analysis, looking at news media reports, online news comments, especially around YouTube, because a lot of parents are also interested in, in keeping up with a lot of these policies through um, YouTube videos made by sort of ed tech or education experts. So I think I can end over here as the time is up, but uh, I would really appreciate any uh, comments or feedback from you. Okay, so um, as before, hopefully the online people can hear us now. Please shout if not, um, or type in the chat. Um, maybe <laughs> you wouldn't be able to hear that. Um, I'll take any questions from the room, and then if any online um, viewers have got questions, please type in the chat. Um, so does uh, anyone have questions for Sami? in the room. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, really interesting one. I'd love to talk more about this too. I know in the UK also, so Neil Sellin is running a lot about yes. sort of the pitfalls of, of sort of techno solutionism. Yes. Um, like spanning 25 years. So yeah. there's, there is a lot of critical literature on sort of the problems of technical fixes in education. Right. Um, and also there's some more recent reflections on how um, sort of critical ed tech research can also help to sort of like uh, foster hype, right? To sort of respond to hype in a way that sort of raises the importance of it. So um, that's sort of like a it's sort of what I'm thinking. I'm more sharing a sort of personal reflection too, that I think a lot a lot about in sort of my own research about how to best res how to best respond to some of these sort of you know novel technologies and is is sort of the the rush to sort of critique also um, possibly like furthering uh, the cause, so some of the underlying motivations to, and so it, allowing the discourse to sort of expand. Um, so just wondering if you're, if you, I mean, this is just sort of an open comment, but if you have sort of thoughts on sort of how sort of we as sort of critical researchers also respond to sort of you know, novel technologies. Yeah. That's actually really, really interesting. Thank you so much for that question because I recently 